Aloha, good morning, happy Monday. Thank you so much for joining us after that Easter weekend. We hope that you had a good time with your family, socially distanced and careful, of course. Uh, we're so happy uh, this morning, Ryan, to be joined by a very special guest from the state capitol. That's right, we're gonna be joined now by Governor David Ige. Governor, good morning, thanks so much for joining us here this morning. Yeah, good morning, uh, Ryan and Yanji. Thanks so much for giving me this opportunity to uh, respond to questions and uh, keep all of you uh, updated. Yeah, we certainly appreciate it. Governor, we want to start off, of course, with uh, the rising cases here in the state of Hawaii. We're slowly seeing the number of positive cases in the state continue to go up. Uh, and with that, there is, you know, talk about Oahu moving back into tier two because of these rising numbers uh, and the average daily count here on the island of Oahu. Uh, what are, let's start off with your thoughts on the overall numbers, where we're at as a state. And uh, would you support Mayor Blangiardi moving uh, Oahu back into tier two? Uh, you know, Ryan, we definitely are concerned here with the increasing case counts. You know, we are are getting to the point of uh, averaging triple digits again, which, you know, is something that we want to avoid. I think what oftentimes gets missed is that um, with these increasing case counts, it really uh, does provide more opportunities for variants, uh, which we are concerned about. You know, we want to really get everyone vaccinated that's the best opportunity for the health and safety of our community. Uh, and uh, this increase in case counts doesn't help with that. Yeah, Krista has a has a comment and she just says, this was not slowly, this was in less than a month. Um, what's really striking about the numbers is that it took us from, I believe, October to get to go to tier three. Um, but as, as she points out, it just happened so quickly. Can you tell us about um, the logistics of a change if there were to be one? Um, do, like, does Blangiardi come to you? And then how long does that request take to be approved? Take us through that process, if you would. Yeah, uh, certainly. And and we have been having discussions, you know, I've had uh, two or three discussions with the mayor uh, in the last week alone, uh, just really talking about the case counts. Um, you know, we've had meetings with um, um, Sarah Kemble, the state epidemiologist, and, and Dr. Char, uh, just talking about um, the, the case counts and the different options. Um, as you know, the, the county does uh, issue their orders uh, and the framework um, for the tier system is actually in the county order. Uh, and so uh, the mayor would have to make a decision. It's very clear that by the benchmarks, um, this Wednesday, uh, we will um, definitely be in tier two. Uh, and the question just becomes um, what would happen? Uh, you know, the primary difference between tier two and tier three is gathering sizes. Um, uh, in the tier two definition, it would go back to uh, five instead of 10. Uh, and, you know, and that's the big concern that we're seeing. Uh, you know, the, the caller had, had asked earlier, yes, we did see a pretty rapid acceleration in the case counts, really in the month of March. Uh, in the month of March, we went from, you know, 20 something to now we're at um, triple digits. Uh, that is a concern. Uh, it's clear when I walk around and see you know, people that have let their guard down, I, we are see, beginning to see more uh, gatherings in public spaces. Uh, and remember everyone, it's uh, the gatherings without a mask that really does spread the virus. Uh, and certainly we want to encourage everyone to continue to wear their masks, regardless of where they're vaccinated, uh, maintain physical distancing, uh, because that's what slows the spread of the virus. Uh, let's stay on the uh, topic of masks if we can here, because we know that we've spoken to some hospitality officials, some who work in the industry and some leaders in there, and they're seeing a lot of tourists that come to the islands that are not wearing masks. So clearly the messaging uh, of our mask mandate here in Hawaii is not getting across to them. Uh, oftentimes tourists are saying that in their state they don't have to, or when they're outdoors they don't have to. Uh, how are you, uh, how can the state continue to help get this message across? And is there anything on the enforcement side that can be done to help to really make sure that they're getting this message? You know, we're working with the industry, Ryan, because, you know, we want to make sure that um, that the visitor can be uh, reminded every opportunity that we can, because if it if it gets lax uh, in one uh, facility, then uh, it won't take long before uh, people ignore the mask mandate. 
Uh, so once again, you know, we're working with the airlines to reinforce the message um, all the way um, when people board the plane, they are informed that Hawaii does have a mask mandate, both indoors and outdoors, that masks are required uh, and that our order actually requires it um, in every business. So, um, you know, we are uh, working with uh, the properties and the, and the hotels to remind their um, customers Again, you know, sometimes it's difficult to to tell a customer that um, he's breaking the law or the rules. But I think it's important that every everyone at every opportunity remind visitors that uh, masks are required here. Karen has a question. She says, do you think that part of the problem is enforcement, large gatherings, both indoors and outdoors? You know, the police obviously can't be, you know, at every potluck and at every, you know, home gathering. So what can be done when it comes to enforcement? We have seen, you know, raves and large weddings and, you know, illegal parties, but that's not necessarily the only place where the, the disease is spreading. Um, yes, Yanji, we, we know that enforcement is important and we uh, talk about it with the mayors uh, all the time. Um, we are, are trying to do better. Um, you know, there is a lot more information on social media. And I think, um, you know, I've stood up a, a statewide uh, law enforcement uh, group to share information. You know, we are working on the so social media front. I, I think we know that the best strategy is as soon as we hear of an organized event that we take action, reach out to the, the promoters or the people organizing the event, inform them that it's um, not appropriate and illegal during this time and really ask for their cooperation uh, should, to shut down the event uh, as quickly as we can. You know, we reach out to the military uh, commanders and ask them to uh, re-emphasize and, um, and get more active in terms of enforcement amongst uh, their personnel. Uh, and we are working uh, with all the counties and all, all the police departments uh, to really make an effort to um, defuse these gatherings ahead of time. I'm going to bring in another question from Chris asking, will the state of Hawaii implement the COVID vaccine digital passport for entering the state uh, for travel? I'm assuming is what you meant to continue on saying there. But what is an up? Uh, if, if you can provide us an update, we know that the CDC recently also presented uh, their thoughts and their recommendations moving forward for traveling for those who have been vaccinated. Where does the state stand right now on any sort of implementation of a uh, you know COVID digital passport? Yeah, so a couple of things, Ryan, thanks for that question. Uh, we are currently uh, running uh, pilots with two of the leading companies, uh, Common Pass uh, and Clear. Uh, Common Pass, we're a little bit further along. Um, you know, we have a couple of um, pilot flights and airlines that we're working with. Uh, right now, the, the pilot really involves uh, using their application, the, the Common Pass and the Clear application, to verify that someone has taken the test within um, Hawaii's parameters and got a negative result. Now, we're the next step in the pilot is really integrating that into Safe Travels so that uh, through the Safe Travels app, if uh, someone has worked with Clear or Common Pass to get the test results, uh, then it would show up in the Hawaii Safe Travels um, application. Now, both of these companies are leading companies to implement the vaccine. Uh, passports, you know, and we've been working with them. Um, you know, it's a huge challenge because, um, you know, because every state has taken the lead in vaccinations and in much of this COVID-19 pandemic, every state is doing um, their vaccination records differently. So, uh, you know, both of these companies uh, understand that it's important to us. And I believe that they will be amongst the first uh, two companies that actually get a working uh, vaccine passport. Uh, and we're just glad that they're working with us because that means that Hawaii would be able to incorporate that um, much, much ahead of other jurisdictions. What would that actually look like? Are we anticipating something added to your driver's license or would it be its own ID card? And how soon could we see that kind of a verification system in place? 
Um, you know, that's, uh, I think that that's the big question, um, Yanji. I think it, you know, it won't happen for at least four weeks or so. Um, you know, there's, um, every state is doing it a little bit differently, and some states are better organized than others. Um, so, you know, in working with these companies, as I said, you know, they're working with all the states because they understand how important it is. Uh, and they do say that it's a while away, you know, that there is, uh, many variables that they're working through. Um, you know, they're really committed to make it happen as quickly as possible, uh, but there is much more work to be done. And and uh, especially for Common Pass, you know, they are an international service. So we've uh, been working on and doing pilots, even with some of our international partners, uh, Japan Airlines and others, uh, because we know how important the international traveler will be um, uh, to, especially to the state of Hawaii. You know, I want to stay on this topic of, of tourism, if we can, and, and the guests, I guess, that we are trying to attract here to the state of Hawaii. And, and when we re go back in time about a year ago, and we had this discussion with you and other leaders, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk about redefining what tourism looks like uh, for Hawaii and the type of visitors that we want to attract, the higher end maybe that would spend more, not see the record numbers that we saw prior to the pandemic. Uh, and you know, since in spring break, we saw a large influx of people coming to the state. What is being done to, I guess, g carry out that vision of redefining what tourism means and not just opening up the gates when things are open again, but really trying to learn from what was said and thought about during the pandemic about redefining what tourism in Hawaii will look like moving forward. Yes, Ryan, you know, the Hawaii Tourism Authority and their new CEO, John DeFries, uh, really has a strategic plan that really focuses on Malama Hawaii uh, and balancing uh, the impact that visitors have uh, with, um, you know, attracting a different kind of uh, visitor, someone who um, embraces Native Hawaiian culture and uh, is willing to help us protect our culture and the environment here in the islands, which is so important. Uh, you know, as you know, on the North Shore of Kauai with um, the Hanalei State Park, we started that whole notion of uh, limiting the number of visitors we get here, uh, working with the industry to create um, a path system uh, to limit uh, the visitors and, and then, you know, changing parking and establishing shuttle services uh, so that we could reduce the impact um, uh, on the community and on the environment um, in um, giving the visitors a much, much better um, experience. So we're taking that model created on North Shore of Kauai and really taking it to other um, areas. I've been working with uh, Senator Kalani English and uh, Representative Lynn DeCoy um, on um, the Hana Highway uh, and uh, some of the um, areas that have seen uh, tremendous impact um, from visitors, uh, trying to see if we can implement the same kinds of programs there. Um, and then I do think, Ryan, that one of the big causes um, of us not being able to be um, better managers of the visitors uh, is the explosion of illegal vacation rentals. You know, I'm very concerned, again, uh, the headline in this morning's paper talking about uh, vacation rental registrations, uh, again, uh, outpacing uh, hotel re um, reservations. Uh, that's a real big concern. You know, um, we hear it from the communities. They would rather have visitors uh, in resort areas in, and in um, designated hotels um, you know, the whole impact of illegal vacation rentals being in residential areas, again, is uh, rearing its head. And we uh, definitely need to um, make a better effort on clamping down on illegal vacation rentals. I want to ask you, you know, when Dr. Libby Char was on here, she, we asked her just about her personal behavior. Um, and she said that on a personal level, she's not comfortable, even though it is tier three, although we could see that slide back. But she said that she's not comfortable going out to eat in a restaurant, for instance, and that she only gathers with one you know, household at a time. Um, I wonder what your personal sort of decisions are around those kinds of issues and how you navigate what's safe and what's not. Yeah, thanks, uh, Yanji, for that um, that question. And I think, you know, it really does come down to uh, personal preference. And, uh, you know, we want to be able to uh, support local businesses and, and local restaurants. We've we've uh, started doing takeout 
from restaurants a lot more frequently than we normally would. Uh, I've always felt that that's a safe compromise. You know, it, it allows us to support the businesses uh, at the same time, uh, helps to keep their employees and, and us personally um, safe. Um, we do know that uh, many restaurants are doing a good job of maintaining um, cleanliness and sanitation. But again, uh, if you look at the cluster reports, we still see um, virus cases and clusters uh, centered around uh, restaurants and other kinds of uh, activities. So, I mean, I think everyone needs to make judgments about that. I, I'm very much concerned. Uh, about people dropping their guard, especially if they, uh, if they know that they've been vaccinated um, and tend to think that it's back to business as usual. That's absolutely the wrong behavior. I think we all need to continue to wear our masks and, and socially distance, uh, at least until um, you know we get to herd immunity and everyone who wants to get vaccinated can get vaccinated. You know, it's safer for individuals, it's safer for our, our overall community if we just continue to do those things. You know, we're getting a lot of, of course, questions about inter-island travel. It seems to come up every time we talk to you with people um, who really just want the opportunity to be able to travel without having to take the test. Many are saying it's just an, another added expense for their family to have everyone tested to just travel inter-island to see a family member. Uh, what are your thoughts on any sort of changes to the inter-island travel and the current restrictions that are in place with testing and or quarantine for those who don't get the, t uh, the testing done? You know, we continue to talk about that, Ryan, uh, every week. And uh, unfortunately, you know, Oahu and Maui have been stuck in these clusters and they've been actually increasing the case counts. Uh, and that really has been a concern. So I, I would just wanna ask everyone to continue to be patient. Uh, you know, we do see uh, and anticipate um, you know, if we hit the mark and uh, May 1st, anyone who wants to get vaccinated can get uh, scheduled their vaccinations. Um, I, I do think that we would be in a much, much better place to allow for inter-island travel more freely. Um, you know, and I think until we get to that point where everyone has the opportunity to get vaccinated and everyone who wants to be vaccinated is vaccinated, you know, just ask everyone to be patient. You know, it's really a matter of weeks. Uh, and that would make a, a big difference for everyone involved. What kind of outreach is the state doing to get to communities that might not have the access to vaccines? Uh, you know, to, to they might not have a primary care doctor. They might not have those relationships. Are you know, is the state prepared to go into, for instance, uh, public housing complexes and set up shop there, or into more rural areas on some of the the neighbor islands? Can you tell us about some of the steps that are being taken? to make sure that those who actually want that vaccine can have access? Yes, uh, thanks uh, Yanji for that question. We actually are doing that right now with a combination of National Guard um, uh, healthcare professionals. You know, we do have a task force medical with uh, doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals in the National Guard. Uh, and they have been uh, targeting, especially, you know, when we have a outbreak or cluster uh, in public housing or in a condominium where uh, they do see a number of cases. Uh, we have been going in and offering testing to uh, all of the residents uh, in those facilities. And then uh, we've also um, started to offer vaccination um, for those who are in those uh, areas where we see uh, increasing um, clusters and outbreaks. Um, you know, Yanji, we have always, from the very beginning, uh, very focused on a broad distribution of the vaccine, trying to get uh, partners involved as, as many as we can. Uh, so we are working with um, especially the independent and smaller pharma uh, pharmacies uh, to ask them uh, to uh, help us when we identify um, patients or uh, individuals who maybe shut-ins and don't have um, someone who could drive them around. Uh, we've asked uh, these uh, smaller pharmacies to, to make a house call to be able to uh, deliver the vaccine to those who can't make it. Uh, again, we also are working with the community health centers uh, and they've had uh, individuals and uh, set up uh, vaccination as well as testing opportunities. Uh, and they are going in uh, door to door whenever we have these uh, cluster outbreaks. 
Uh, and so it is kind of an all of government response. You know, we want to uh, be able to go into and reach uh, those who have a difficult time coming into a pharmacy or vaccination center, uh, because we want everyone who wants to get vaccinated to have that opportunity. What would be the next step in this vaccination process? Because we've seen slowly this, of course, we're following the protocol that has been set in place and then the different ages, like 70, 75, 65, 60. Uh, when will it get to the point where it's sort of 30 and over or 30 to 50? I mean, what, what's that next range? And uh, because I expect that there's going to be a lot of people in this uh, general population category and just trying to think through how the state is going to manage a, a large population of people trying to get the vaccine uh, in their arm before this, you know, sort of deadline of May 1st that the, the challenge that the president has put on the states. Uh, yeah, Brian, you know, that is one of the reasons why we've tried to engage everybody who uh, normally is involved with vaccines to be able to do that. Uh, we did anticipate um, as we opened up um, vaccinations to the general public uh, that we wanted um, people to have as many opportunities um, in their communities uh, to get vaccinated. Uh, so I actually spoke with Dr. Char this morning and she says, we are really making good progress in um, priority one Cs. Uh, and, and so she does anticipate in the next week or so uh, that we would have completed all of the priority groups um, and, and uh, industries uh, and, and really are on track um, for that uh, May 1st target. Um, and so uh, I, I think part of that, Ryan, is that, um, you know, we continue to work with the industry people because we, um, we want to provide um, uh, vaccination opportunities um, in a structured way to try and reach as many people as quickly as possible. So, you know, it might be kind of a hybrid where we're working with industry um, to get focused um, uh, vaccination um, sites and pods available to um, those uh, workers, um, you know, who are typically more exposed because they interact with the public. Uh, at the same time, you know, we do anticipate um, expanding um, to uh, more locations. Uh, in speaking with the White House, they do anticipate that all pharmacies uh, would be involved with um, vaccinations and you know, last week we saw a, a big increase in the number of CVS and Walgreens stores. Uh, you know, and Libya has been working with all the independent uh, good neighbor pharmacies all around the state as well. Um, so, you know, Brian, we're hopeful that having 100, 150, maybe 200 locations for people to get uh, vaccinations will help distribute um, um, that um, huge demand um, and, um, you know, it'll be manageable, uh, we think. Um, but, you know, we'll have to see how that works out. I want to go back uh, just to this issue of enforcement, because I see so many comments here uh, talking about, you know, I saw a group doing, you know, not wearing a mask or and Angela Keene from Quarantine Couple Breakers is on here as well this morning. And she's saying, you know, we're hearing a lot of reports of underground parties. One of the things that I know her group, and I don't know how familiar you are with this, but one of the things that her group is working on with Senator Dela Cruz is uh, a possible legislation to allow to uh, deputize retired police officers, retired law enforcement, to then serve as a sort of, uh, you know, enforcement task force, if you will, so that, you know, HPD and the AG's office would have another sort of tool in the toolbox, if you will, that they, they would just focus on mask enforcement and, and crowd size and what have you. Is that something that you would support? What, what are your thoughts on having that kind of a, a, a force, if you will? Uh, certainly, Yanji, we do know that enforcement is important. And, you know, I know that um, we we hear from uh, Angela uh, quite frequently. And, you know, she's uh, her tips have really um, led to arrest and enforcement actions. And we do appreciate that. Yeah, I think it's a great idea, um, you know, for retired uh, police officers or law enforcement personnel, if they would uh, like to provide that service uh, to help with enforcement. You know, we continue to work with uh, all the police departments. Um, it's a huge challenge just because uh, of um, people letting their guard down and, and, you know, starting to be less rigorous about wearing masks and complying with the, the limitations on gathering. So, 
you know, we I think we would welcome that. We know that without enforcement, uh, all of these restrictions are less effective. And the more that we can do to enforce it, uh, the more we'll get compliance because people know that if they don't um, comply with the, the guidelines and the rules and the laws, uh, that uh, action will be taken. Uh, and I think I, I misspoke the last time we were on the bill uh, to change it to a fine rather than a misdemeanor uh, is still alive and in process. And, you know, we do believe that that would be helpful because um, making someone subject to a fine would give us a better chance of collecting on that uh, and really would avoid clogging down our court for things like, you know, someone wasn't wearing a mask. Uh, out in public, you know, it's easy easier to find them uh, and collect them fine than actually have to go through a trial, a jury trial to try and convict them of, of breaking the rule or the law. You know, we're running out of time here, but I do want to get to a few other questions, uh, especially things with going on with the legislature. We know that there is a bill right now that is moving through the legislature that would uh, require the DOE to publicly identify the schools that have positive COVID-19 cases. Uh, would you support anything like that under, you know, the current way that protocol that things are now, the DOE is not listing, listing the school name. Would you be in favor of legislation like that? You know, I, I think I'd have to look at what it says specifically, Ryan. You know, Department of Health is always trying to balance. You know, they don't want to stigmatize location or businesses or organizations because, you know, then it would make them less cooperative with us. You know, when we do have a case, we want their help. We need to identify those who may be exposed. Uh, and if they believe that they'll get, you know, identified and, and uh, criticized in the public, then they'll be less um, likely to help us uh, try and contain the outbreak. So, yeah, I'll have to see what the measure provides. You know, everyone, uh, when there is an infection uh, involving a school, everyone who may have been exposed and the parents generally are informed uh, of the case so that um, we can keep children and, and faculty and staff safe at the school campuses. Okay, and just a lot of people who might be joining us late keep asking if we were going to move back into tier two. Uh, if that does happen, uh, just to pe for, pe for people to understand, that is a decision in Mayor Blangiardi's hands, but uh, just your, your thoughts on that. Yes, you know, certainly I think um, we are, are very much concerned with the high level of the virus activity uh, right now. I, I know the mayor um, is um, trying to re reassess and calibrate. We do see that there are fewer uh, hospitalizations uh, and, uh, and fewer deaths. And I, I do think that that uh, comes into play. Uh, you know, and the challenge is that, you know, we are so close to being into May and June where we anticipate that we will hit herd immunity and that everyone who wants to be vaccinated will be vaccinated. You know, and then um, many in our community would uh, be able to get back to the new normal. And how do we just hold our community together to get through these last uh, few weeks and months uh, in a way that allows everyone to uh, enjoy what it used to be? I mean, I think that that's the balancing act. All right, Governor Ige, uh, any final thoughts here? We, we know that uh, we have a few more minutes left, but <laughs> any final words or anything uh, that you would like to share this morning? I just really want to ask everyone to continue to be patient. I really appreciate all of the personal sacrifices that everyone has made. You know, you and I uh, have been uh, not interacting and have stopped um, from meeting people that we normally do. I just want to ask everyone uh, to be a little more patient. We want to give everyone the opportunity to get vaccinated. I think that's really important for our entire community. Uh, and we all should, whether we're vaccinated or not at this point, we should continue to act in the appropriate way, wear our masks, wash our hands, maintain physical distancing until everyone in our community has the chance to be vaccinated. And that's the best thing we can do to really get through this uh, COVID pandemic and really get to the new normal on the other side. Okay, Governor David Ige, thank you so much for spending so much of your morning with us. Aloha. Thank you so much again, Yanji and Ryan, for giving me this opportunity. It's uh, something I look forward to all the time. Uh, I do appreciate having the, uh, the chance to respond to questions from the public. Well, we look forward to it as well. So thank you. The feelings mutual. Have a great week. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you.
And thanks to all the people who are writing in questions. We really appreciate that because we like to know what you're thinking about. And it's a wonderful opportunity to have direct access uh, to the person who's really making so many of the decisions. So many of your questions though, and that's why we asked it again, uh, you know, you know, what's going to happen with tier one, tier two and tier three. It's really not up to the governor. What it, you know, it's really up to Mayor Blangiardi. Yeah, and he's making it clear, though, that they have had conversations about what would happen. You know, he said at the top of this broadcast that they've had two to three conversations within the past week alone uh, about what should happen, uh, how they could manage through this, because we know that the biggest implication of moving backwards would be the gathering sizes, uh, would be moving those groups of 10 down to groups of five, which ultimately also will impact things like restaurants and other sites of things that have already been established and have reopened essentially uh, because of that. And we also know that the mayor has extended hours of liquor sales. Uh, there have been exceptions made for weddings. Uh, the question then becomes, do all of those things that were just unlocked and, and you know, sort of reopened, do they all kind of go back down to where we were, uh, you know, in tier two earlier this year? So uh, that, again, we will have to wait to see what information we're getting from Honolulu Hale. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the first thing that popped into my mind is all the parents who just geared up and got ready to go back for youth sports. And so what's going to happen with that? Is that still part of tier three or can there be an adjustment made so that it is part of tier th two? Um, really hard to know at this point. Thank you all for your questions. Uh, and also very interesting to hear his comments on uh, the proposal by De Senator Dela Cruz and uh, the Quarantine Couple Breakers group that he would support having some kind of a COVID task force that was, you know, really focused on that particular kind of enforcement, um, just because it obviously is too much for current law enforcement to handle. Yeah, and we also hear that there uh, could be, you know, we know that one of the topics that always come up is neighbor island travel. And if there's going to be any changes to that, doesn't seem like that's happening anytime soon. As the governor says, the case counts on Oahu and Maui continue to be high. And a lot of questions about vaccination passports. Uh, he's saying that they're closely working with two companies, but it could be a ways away, maybe even a month or so more down the road before anything like that get, gets implemented. So nothing that we could expect to see anytime soon. We know a lot of you have a lot of financial and economic concerns. We're going to be talking about that with our guest on Wednesday. Senator Brian Schatz will be joining us. Um, you know, We're going to be talking about the COVID relief package that passed and what that actually means for individuals on the ground here in Hawaii. $1.9 trillion is a lot of money. How does it trickle down to the states? And specifically, how does it trickle down to individuals? So we're very, look, very much looking forward to having Senator Schatz with us on Wednesday. That's right. Another full week of shows. Uh, and uh, on Friday, we will be, I don't, we have Anton Krucki, who is the, right. from the Office of Housing and Homelessness. This is actually a really exciting guest. We're excited about him. He just took over this office for the city, um, and he's going to be talking about affordable housing and how this administration plans to tackle homelessness. Um, it's an issue that was an issue before the pandemic, but of course is exacerbated by COVID-19, as are so many other things. So we really look forward to talking with him as well. So thanks to all of you for joining us, and we hope to see you right back here Wednesday at 1030. Aloha. We'll see you then.